So um, I'd like to say good morning. My name's Sarah Lodge. I'm director of a company called Beehive Coaching and Leadership Development. We provide coaching, accredited coaching training and coaching supervision. And today I'm going to talk to you about the, the theory of psychological games and how that plays out in coaching and in coaching relationships. So I hope people weren't coming here expecting to find out about games that you can play in the coaching relationship. Um, it's much more about the, the psychological level here. I trained for six years um, as a clinical transactional analyst and I ran a, a private therapy practice as a trainee psychotherapist alongside my organisational work before focusing on, on organisational work. And I like TA theories and models because although they're just models and theories, so they're not true, they gave a lot of explanations for me or a way of making sense of why people behave in ways that may seem negative on the surface and, and also picking up on what Robert was talking about. Why sometimes even when you have clarity around what success is for you or what you want to achieve, you can sometimes end up reverting back to behaviours or patterns of behaviours that take you away from achieving that success and end up with a, a negative kind of outcome. I came across games a lot in therapy with my therapy clients, I come across them a lot with coaching clients, I come across them a lot in organisations and in coaching supervision. So I think if you're, if you're training to be a coach, if you're working within organisations in learning and development, then an understanding of game theory is, is really helpful, it can bring you coaching up to a different level. Um, you'll notice on there as well, there are some hashtags if anybody tweets, then please feel free to tweet at those hashtags during the session so that we can share insights and, and questions um, over Twitter during the session as well. Okay. So the presentation is basically going to cover an introduction to psychological games, some idea about coach games, so games you might come across in coaching, but also games you might play. Analyzing games, but also some tips on how to avoid games or how to help your clients to step out of games again. Now, I'm also in process at the moment of developing a series of cartoons and cartoon characters to illustrate um, coaching in particular, so I'd like to introduce you to two characters who you'll see during the presentation. Uh, this is a work in progress, so bear with me. So if you imagine that these two people are learning and development professionals in a large organization, could be public sector, could be private sector. So this is Joe and Harriet. So Joe and Harry, Joe, Harry, and they will be providing you with a window on <laughs> to coaching and organizational development. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that, actually, I'm afraid, in terms of jokes. But this is just an example of a cartoon involving Joe and Harriet. In order to fully get a sense of what organisational games are about, there are certain things that you need to sort of buy into or at least hold as possibly being true to really get a sense of what the motives are behind games. Now, some of you may be familiar with something called the iceberg model, which is a model of what's above the surface of the iceberg, what you can see of people, their behaviours, what they say, what they're conscious of. But there's a lot below the surface, much more below the surface, that you don't see and that the individual might not be aware of, that comprise things like experiences, motives, beliefs, values, etc. Now, if you think about um, what's required in terms of what you buy into to understand psychological games. The first thing is, it's one of the basic principles of TA, which is humans communicate at two different levels, or we interact at two different levels. So there's a social level, which with the iceberg model is what's above the surface, and there's the psychological level, which is what's underneath the surface, what you don't actually see. Okay. Now, it's not that there's a conscious and a subconscious and they're two separate buckets in the brain. It's more that if you think about when you're born and the brain is just a big mass of neurons there, 
It's pre-verbal, so you can't speak. It's pre-rational, you don't have rational functioning. But somehow you need to survive, and you need to develop behaviours and strategies for surviving. That some of our responses are laid down so early in our lives that we're not aware of them being there, we're not conscious of them. They're not things we can verbalise because they were laid down, those neural pathways were laid down before we could even speak. They're not rational, they sometimes don't make sense as well, because they were laid down before we had full adult functioning. So those murky depths are just places in the brain, messages, etc., that were laid down so early we're not conscious of them. But they play a part in our lives and they, they form a motivation for our behaviours and dictate some of the patterns of behaviours. And following on from that, there are sometimes... What we see on the surface is negative social behaviours. So people behaving in ways that create what socially on the surface appear to be really negative outcomes. They have a positive psychological motive or a positive psychological basis. Now the reason sometimes those patterns of behaviour or outcomes don't make sense to us socially is because they were laid down so early in our lives in childhood when we didn't have rational thinking. So we, we made connections between things that happened, stimuli and responses, and we tried to make sense of them in the only way we could as children. Now very often that's around um, patterns of stories, so we make stories out of them, we fit them into stories or fairy tales or whatever that we heard when we were children. But we can make connections that aren't actually causal but we made them when we were children, and they appeared that way. But the psychological outcome, the positive psychological outcome, of all those patterns of behaviour are survival. So it's how could we get what we needed as we developed from, from babyhood onwards to enable us to survive the best possible way and get maximise what we needed from the environment around us. So if you think about... If you have a seed that grows, and what a plant needs to grow, what does a plant need to grow? Water is one thing, what else? Okay, water and sunlight. So if you've got a strong source of sunlight above, and good soil and water below, then the roots will grow down straight and strong, and the plant will grow up and will be straight. If, however, you've got sunlight that comes in from one side, what happens to the plant? It grows bent, so it grows towards that source of sunlight because that's the way it maximises what it needs in order to grow. And as humans, we, we do that as well, in a way. We know what we need to survive. There's a very strong survival instinct as a child. We need food. We need emotional stimulation. We need physical stimulation. And we grow and develop patterns of behaviours that enable us to maximise that from our environment. And sometimes, if the only kind of attention or stimulation we get is negative, we'll develop patterns of behaviour that lead to negative attention because that's the best attention that we've got. Okay? Now, this final point... The outcome of any human interaction takes place at the psychological level, not the social level. So it doesn't matter what's going on on the surface. It's what's happening at the psychological level that matters, because that's where the outcome will be resolved. Now, most of the time, what's going on above the surface and below the surface is what we call congruent. So there is the same thing going on. But there are times when what we're saying is different to what's going on underneath the surface. And at those times, the outcome is determined at the psychological level. So to use the, the words of those philosophers, the Spice Girls, it's not what you want, it's what you really, really want that matters. If, for example, you have, uh, I don't know, you're doing some life coaching and you have somebody who comes to you and they're overweight and they say they want to lose weight. And they know about diets and they know about exercise and they've tried them and they're still not losing weight. 
there may be that at a psychological level, losing weight is not a good thing for them, that deep down they don't want to lose weight, for whatever reason. So when we talk about working at social and psychological level, and you may hear this as working at content and process level, it's not what people say they want to happen, it's what actually happens that you need to be paying attention to. Because that's where the motivation for the behaviours is being, is being held at that psychological level. Okay? That makes sense? Kind of bought into that, or at least holding that as an idea or a possibility? Okay. I'm not going to go too much into the theory of transactional analysis because you can, you can research this on, on the web or in books or whatever. But I'm going to briefly go through the PAC model, the ego states model, because that is Burns' seminal model, really, that TA is based on. And if you think about the iceberg model, this is just a different depiction of the iceberg model, in a way. So, if you think about... Burns talked about we have three different elements to our personality, and he described those as the parent, the adult, and the child. Now, the adult element is, if you think about the iceberg model, that is what is engaging socially with the here and now. It's what people can see. It's those activities that we're aware of and we're conscious of. The parent and child ego states consist of patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we laid down very early on in our lives that continue to develop but are still there, but they're they form that, that underneath bit of the iceberg, the bit that's below the surface. And there are times when we're not aware of engaging in those kind of behaviours. We're not aware of what we talk about going into parent or child ego state. But those behaviours kick in out of our awareness and without us, us being um, conscious of it. And what that means is we're replaying a pattern of behaviours from our past rather than responding to what's actually going on in the here and now, right now. Um, so there we have. So basically the pack model. If you think about in this room at the moment, you may look around and you may see a whole bunch of people here. But what we've really got in the room at the moment are your parents, which might be quite frightening. Our parent figures from your past are you as various stages in childhood. They're all there, they're all accessible. They're all right here with us now. Now it's possible to have, to display a certain ego state behavior while experiencing a different ego state internally. Now just as an example of this, you're all looking very attentively at the moment. My guess is that some of you will have noticed that there were spelling mistakes on the couple of slides before. Yeah. Some of you may have made an internal judgment around how could anybody set themselves up as a presenter without proofreading their PowerPoint slides first of all. Judgment, internal parent experience, external adult display. Some of you may have looked at it and had a little giggle, secret giggle to yourself about, oh my God, look at that. Internal free child, external adult display. There might be some of you who felt a little bit sorry for the fact that I'd done this and how awful I must be feeling. Internal nurturing parent, external adult display. Now, if you experienced any of that, my guess is you weren't aware when you were making that judgment of, oh, I mean parent or, or aware, it just happened automatically, it just happened like that. That's what happens when we move into ego states, when we start replaying behaviours or responses from the past. Okay. I hasten to add that any spelling mistakes from now on are entirely intentional. So if you see any, you have you know, full permission to be judgmental about my um, proofreading skills. When we talk about psychological games, we're talking about childhood strategies, so patterns of behavior that we learned as children, so they're held in the child ego state, that we start to replay if we get a stimulus in the here and now that reminds us enough of a situation in the past that we learn to play these particular behaviors around. And 
There are particular characteristics of psychological games. The more of these characteristics that are present in an interaction, the more likely it is that a game is taking place. So I'm going to take you through the characteristics now, and then I'm going to give you an example of a psychological game that I came across. Now, many of the examples I'm going to use came out of a piece of research I did into chief executive behavior a couple of years ago. I will use the chief executives that were not from any public sector organizations in Wales. So you won't recognize these people per se, but you may recognize the dynamics very, very clearly. I'm not picking on chief executives because chief executives are the only people who play games. We all play games. But when you're talking about games at leadership levels, they have significantly more impact than games played lower down the organization or in families. Because the games that leaders play can impact on hundreds, if not thousands, sometimes millions of people if you're talking about leaders of countries. Oh, sorry. So there we have it. Right. A non-conscious dynamic. So we aren't aware when we start playing psychological games. That is one of the defining factors. They are out of consciousness. So we start playing them. Their roots are in that deep murkiness under the water, if you think of the iceberg model. You need at least two players for a game. And there's a repetitive element to games. So you say the same thing happening time and time again. Now you might see the same thing happening being played out with different people. Or you might have the same person going through the same patterns of behavior time and time again. So there's a sense of here we go again. It's familiar. It's also predictable. Now when we say it's predictable, it's only predictable from the people on the outside who are watching it happen. The people on the inside seem utterly, blithely unaware of what's going on. So an onlooker can see what's going to happen. And this idea of it'll all end in tears is uh, a familiar kind of sense if you've got people engaged in a game. There's a socially plausible situation. So on the surface, it looks like, well, of course, you know, this is just a normal situation. And you can make all kinds of excuses and reasons for why what's happening is happening. But there's a hidden agenda. So the game is not being played for what's happening on the surface. The game is being played for what's happening underneath the surface. And the key characteristic of a game that distinguishes it from those of you who know any TA from rackets is there is a switch point. Now the switch point is where the mood changes, just like that. You get a sense of disorientation. It's like, well, hold on, what happened there? What happened there? You know, one minute we're talking about the top off the toothpaste tube being left off and we have an argument about that, the next minute we're talking about the fact that your in-laws are continually criticizing me. Where did that happen? Where did that switch in mood come? And the final element of it is there's a payoff and that payoff is a negative feeling. A very familiar negative feeling. Now both sides in the game or all players in the game will end up with a negative feeling. It's the negative feeling that we play games for. Now that's a bit nuts, isn't it? It doesn't make much sense. Why would we play games for a negative feeling? But that negative feeling is very familiar to us. That negative feeling confirms our role in the world, confirms beliefs that we hold about ourselves and about other people and about the world in general. So what that negative feeling does it makes the world predictable. Games make the world predictable. We play them so we think we have some control over our environment. Okay. Now, Eric Byrne described games as failed attempts at intimacy. And what he meant by that was when we're engaged in a game, we are in a relationship with other people. 
Now that relationship may not be particularly positive, certainly not at the end, but we're still engaged with other people, we're still interacting with other people, we're getting strokes and recognition and attention from other people. And intimacy is the expression of genuine feeling and genuine emotion and getting close to people at a very, at a very deep level. So it's about authenticity, as Robert was talking this morning, and it's about autonomy, it's about open expression of emotion. And sometimes that can seem a bit risky to us, so rather than have that very genuine expression of emotion and genuine connection, it may be that at a psychological level that's just too risky, so we don't go ahead. It may be the environment isn't conducive to that. It may be that if our upbringing has been so toxic, we actually don't know how to form a healthy, straight relationship with people around us. The only way we know how to relate to people is through, through games and through negative relationships. So you get some people who you know, play games occasionally, as we always do. You'll get some people whose sole method of interacting with the world is through this kind of dynamic. It depends on what their upbringing was, what their experiences were. Now, why do we play games? I'm going to demonstrate why we play games with just three cartoons. Now, you imagine this is Harry. She's had a hard day at work. She's down the pub with her mate. Has anybody ever done this kind of thing down the pub? You go down the pub and you start talking to your mates about what's going on at work. Or you go down the pub with your mates from work and you start talking about what's going on down at work. Right. Now, did, you, did, you, did everybody see the caption? You may not, yep. So Joe takes on too much work passes it on to me, I take it, I'm the one that stays late. It happens time and time again. So the friend just says, well, why don't you just say no? So what's the punchline? Why? Anybody here ever take on work for other people? Anybody here ever have difficulty in saying no? Anybody here ever feel hard done by? or that people are taking advantage of them at all, okay? Well, this gives one of the reasons why we play games, all right? What would I have to complain about, and what would you and I talk about? There'd be two of us sat in the pub. This is a safe thing to talk about. It's not about anything too close. But it gives us something that's interesting, it's meaty. You can get people saying, oh, bless, you know, yes, ain't it awful, it's terrible what happens. Yeah, I get taken advantage of by my boss as well, etc., etc. And it's one of the reasons why we play games. We play games because we get attention and strokes and it creates drama because we can talk to other people about them and we make connections with other people when we talk about our games. So people who play the same game, it's great to get together, you just get together, you open a bottle of wine, and then you just talk about the games that you're playing at work. So you get that social advantage. But you also get the psychological advantage because you can replay that situation in your head on the drive home. You can become more and more outraged as you think about what's happened and how outrageous it is and how often it happens before. So you've got all that, all that energy going into this. But it also confirms beliefs about ourselves and the world that help to make the world predictable. They mean that we don't have to engage in a, in a difficult conversation or make difficult decisions in the here and now, things that might feel interpersonally risky or psychologically risky, but also the real, real motive is we avoid a pain from the past. So we avoid addressing a pain, a difficult situation 
from the past. So that's what games are all about. That's why we play them. Now I'm going to give you an example of one of the chief executive games that I came across. It's just such a perfect example. Right. Socially plausible situation, first of all. The chief executive of the company had staged a management buyout five years before. So it's a large organization, failing department. The department was going to close, everybody was going to be made redundant, so that this individual stepped in and led the management buyout. In the new organization, one of his directors was underperforming. So he worked with him. He was a coach who was really into learning and development. He sat alongside, he coached, he mentored, he developed. And the director didn't make the changes or the improvements. So in the end, the director left. Every day, story of corporate life, really, isn't it? So when I started poking a little bit deeper, other things started to come out of the woodwork. And this is where, in coaching, if somebody presents you with a situation, that need to push, not to take what people are saying at first value, but to push to find out a little bit more about the circumstances around the situation can give you some real indications of what else might be going on. So the first thing I found out was this underperforming individual had been underperforming for a number of years in the parent organization. And the parent organization had been working with this individual, and the individual had not made any changes or improvements. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the parent company told the chief executive, if you stage a management buyout, you have to take this person with you. You cannot sack them, and we will not sack them. So they have to come with you in that organization. OK? Slightly odd, underperforming, but there's an imperative there. The chief executive spent three years working with this director. Three years. He was the sales director. And the chief executive lied to cover up his poor performance. And as the chief executive said, everybody in the organization was surprised when I sacked him. There just came this point where I felt I had to sack. And everybody was astonished, including the individual themselves, had no idea what was going on and didn't realize what was about to happen. So I pressed a little bit in terms of, so how familiar is this feeling? You know, what's the feeling and how familiar is it? And he said, well, it's a very familiar feeling, actually, because what I feel is I don't have what it takes to be a top chief executive. And I'm from a working class background. And my dad was out in the strikes in the 80s, and he hated managers, and he hated the managing directors. And he told me that I ought to better myself, but he also said, don't betray your working class roots. How am I supposed to do that? So I end up in a chief executive position, but really I'm questioning whether I've got what it takes here. And also questioning whether it's okay for me to do this. And with regards to that repetitive element, he said at the end, interestingly enough, I've got, I've got a similar person in the organization that I'm working with at the moment. Right. So there's a pattern of behavior here that on the surface seems quite straightforward. But underneath, there's something else going on. And when you start probing a little bit more, you start finding these inconsistencies. Why would it take a chief executive three years to sack an underperforming sales director that is having a negative impact on the organization? Why would they lie to cover their behavior and their performance? There's something else going on under the surface there. So, question to throw out to you then. So I've been through why we play psychological games. I've been through the psychological game process, those characteristics. Any 
thoughts or comments on that? Can anybody either recognise a game in themselves or recognise a game that might be being played in their organisation? Very often it's easier to identify a game that you can see somebody else playing than it is to identify your own game. No recognition? Don't, don't see that? Yeah. Okay. a very significant effect. Absolutely. So so what can happen, what I'm hearing is what can happen in a game scenario is you can see the negative dynamic going on. You don't want to be part of it, so you step out of it. But what that means is you don't actually contribute in the way that you could do if if you were if there were straight transactions going on or straight communications going on. Okay. Anybody else recognise this diamond? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can get organisational cultures that actively promote game playing. Sorry, Karen. Absolutely. Who do you, who do you think we we play most of our games with? <laughs> Partly self. You can play internally. Those people closest to us. Generally, when we find life partners, our life partners are those people who play our games most most accurately, most per perfectly. So you could say sometimes that love is about finding somebody who plays your game just perfectly. Sometimes so well that you don't notice you're in a game in your relationship because the negative feelings are so familiar to you that you, you, you just carry on with them. We play games with our children. We play games, I don't know if anybody ever has that situation when they go home at uh, Christmas time, you may go back to your family environment and to your parents and you end up sucked into the same kind of toxic dynamics that you used to have as a child. And it's like, I don't know how, I don't know what happens, but I seem to end up being about five years old when I go back home at Christmas and I still end up playing the same games that I did before. Family games, people tend to be very heavily invested in, so they're invested at a really deep level and they're very difficult to step out of. But organisational games, depending on the level at which people play them, it is possible to raise people's awareness through coaching of the game dynamic and then to support people in stepping out of the game to a more healthy series of transactions and more healthy relationships. When we talk about games, we talk about playing at three levels. So the first level, a first level game is a game that is played in public. 
So it's something that happens in public that you have, there might be minor embarrassment or it might be something that you talk about. But it's not so embarrassing or not so destructive that you feel that you can't tell other people about it. Second degree games tend to be played in private. So they're the kind of games that are played behind closed doors in families or sometimes in boardrooms or whatever. So it's the kind of thing we'd rather publicly people didn't know about us. Third degree games are the most destructive and third degree games result in death or injury to self or others or being imprisoned or being incarcerated in a mental health institution. So we play games for different stakes. If you have people playing third degree games, you shouldn't really be working with them as a coach. Second degree games, you may be invited in to work with people who are um, going through a disciplinary procedure or something like that. So disciplinary procedure, second degree game. First degree games, very much on the surface. People aren't that heavily invested in, so they may be much more likely to let go of their game playing. Now, some of you may have come across this model before, which is a different way of understanding what happens in the game dynamic. And this is called Cartman's Drama Triangle. Now, this was developed by a guy called Stephen Cartman, and he used the idea of dramatic roles. So if you think about any kind of stories, particularly things like Greek, Greek tragedies, soap operas, use the, the, the sort of game pattern very effectively. The different roles, the role of the persecutor or the baddie, the role of the rescuer or the goodie, and the role of the victim are archetypal roles in any kind of drama. And the way drama attracts our attention is through changes in roles. So people change from one role to the another in the course of the game. So someone may begin as persecutor, someone may begin as rescuer, someone may begin as victim. But at that switch point that I mentioned in the game, that's the point at which that hidden agenda becomes apparent and the point at which the game roles change. Now, Julie Hay, when she talks about games, uses the example of a James Bond film to illustrate the shifts around the drama triangle. And as part of my research for this presentation, I was forced to watch Daniel Craig again, um, particularly the bit where he steps out of the sea. Um, but Daniel Craig is rescuer. He's James Bond. He's MI5, right? So he's archetypal rescuer. And there's always a baddie who's going to blow up the world. And there's always a victim, generally the woman, although some changes in the gender roles nowadays in the films. But what happens is James Bond comes in and he goes after the persecutor and the persecutor captures James Bond and James Bond becomes a victim and gets tied up over the swimming pool full of char sharks and then the woman might come in as the rescuer and she rescues James Bond and then James Bond gets the persecutor, the baddie, and he's about to take him in so the baddie becomes the victim and then the baddie's mates come along and they get, and it all switches, they're all switches around those three different roles. Now we know what's going to happen in a James Bond movie, don't we? There has not been a James Bond movie where James Bond has ended up crucified somewhere and the baddies got away with the girl. So why do we get engrossed in the story when we know what's going to happen? Why are we on the edge of our seats waiting for some, to find out whether he is going to be rescued? We know he's going to be rescued. What is it that it hooks? But we do it. We do it with soap operas. We do it with stories, anything, on, on anything that grabs our attention, whether there's some kind of a story to it. You'll find this kind of dynamic. And it's that drama that hooks us in. There's interest, there's excitement, there, there's intrigue. We can see ourselves there, but it's not us. So we can step back and feel a little <laughs> bit better about ourselves because we can see it going on 
or somewhere else. I'm just going to introduce one last element about games before we go on to talk about how we might analyse games and your games in particular. The reason games exist, they exist through discounts. And when we talk about discounts, we talk about we discount elements of our own reality. So if you're a persecutor, the reason you persecute is to avoid dealing with your own sense of vulnerability. So it's a protection against your own fears, your own insecurities, and often what you're trying to do is destroy those insecurities in other people because when you see them, it touches too closely on your own, your own fears. Rescuers also rescue to discount their own vulnerability because what better way to avoid addressing our own fears and insecurities than by telling other people how they can deal with theirs. And victims discount their own potency, their own capacity to act and to be proactive. Okay. What Cartman wanted to make clear with the drama triangle was he always put capital letters before persecutor, victim and rescuer. Now the reason for that is there are real persecutors. So dictators, for example, are real persecutors. They're not playing a persecutor role, a psychological role. <coughs> Victims, for example, somebody stuck on Snowden with a broken leg, they're not playing the victim. They are real victims, they can't walk down. Rescuers, the mountain rescue that goes up and takes them down off the mountain, are real rescuers. But it's not a role, there's no discounting going on there. Okay. Everybody plays games, but we don't all play games with everybody because we only play games with the people that, at a psychological level, we recognize will take our bait, will hook into our particular game playing. And now I just want you to spend five minutes if you have a piece of paper in front of you. This is something called the John James Game Plan. You can um, find this on the internet. It's a really good way of analysing games. And I want you just to spend a few minutes, and this is something that if you suspect one of your coaching clients is engaged in a game, it's something you can use with them to help you and help them analyse the games. So the first thing is if you can think of a situation which has the characteristics of a game. So, socially plausible situation, a sense that there might be something that's, that, that's slightly wrong, or there's, there's something that's not quite right there. That it's repetitive and it's predictable, so you've seen it happen time and time again. That there is a switch point, at which point the mood changes, the tempo changes, the stakes change, or you're absolutely astonished. And it was, what, what happened there? Absolutely, what happened there? And then think about how it ends and how you feel and how the other person might feel. Now, the opening moves, that how does it start, is very important because that's the point at which the game, one game player sort of dangles the bait and the next game player, the people that they're inviting to play the game, that's the point at which they grab the bait. So if you just spend a few minutes thinking about a situation, and then I'm going to go on and take a look at some of the games you can come across in coaching in the workplace, and then how to avoid games. Classic coach game, now this is one that Eric Byrne described, which is the why don't you yes but, or the yes but game. 
And this, this takes the form of somebody who expresses that they have a problem, they have an issue. Now sometimes, if they're really good at playing the game, they don't even tell you they have a problem, they just sigh. And if somebody else is really, really attuned as a rescuer, they'll hear a sigh and they'll pick that up and think, fantastic. Somebody has a problem, I can dive in and help. So the first person expresses what the problem is and the second person starts on coming up with a whole bunch of solutions for that particular problem. And the first person keeps on saying, yes, I've thought of that, but I can't do it because... So the next person says, well, why don't you do this? Yes, I've thought of that, but I can't do it because... And this will play out until a point at which one or other of the people will get angry with the other player and accuse them of either not understanding their situation fully or accusing them of not wanting to solve the problem themselves and wanting to be stuck in the problem. So either way you get two negative feelings. It's either outrage or, or feeling inadequate. And sometimes you can get that external outrage but that internal sense of inadequacy. I can't do anything to help. Now, if you're doing non-directive coaching, you may not get the directive, why don't you do, so kind of a, a closed approach, but you may find yourself in a coaching session being the one as the coach that is doing all the thinking. So you're the one sweating on the seat thinking, what question do I need to ask next to get them to move to this different position? So you're the one doing the work. Now, if you're in that position, it's likely to be a kind of an adaptation of the why don't you yes but, which is you're working very hard to solve the other person's problem for you. And that's not what coaching is about. Coaching isn't about you working very hard. Coaching is about helping the other person or giving the other person the space and the prompts to do their own thinking. The ulterior around this is who's cleverest here? Who knows most about this situation and this job? Anybody ever come across this? The why don't you yes but game? <laughs> Play it quite a lot. Okay. Another game that you may come across in coaching is the indispensable game. Now, which position on the drama triangle do you think learning and development people and coaches are likely to take as the initial role? Rescuer, yeah, absolutely. And what better hook for a rescuer than to be told, you're the only person who can help me with this. You're so good, you understand so much, your skills are so great, you're the only person who can help me here. And what's the hook that a rescuer, a learning development professional has or sees? Somebody with potential. All we want to see is somebody with potential because we can see if they just make those little changes, they will be absolutely fine. So we have somebody with potential and we have somebody being told, yeah, you're, I've got this problem, but you're the only person who can possibly help me in this. client doesn't make the changes, what you can get at the end is the client can get angry and blame the coach. So the client starts to persecute the coach and the coach goes to victim position. Or the coach can start getting angry and start blaming and saying they didn't really want to change in the first place. It's not me, it's them. They didn't really want to change. I'm a really good coach. So then putting the coachee in the victim position. The second element of the John James Games plan is to think about what do you really want to say to them? So what's the ulterior message in your dynamic? What do you really want to say and what are they really wanting to say to you? And to help people to move out of the game, the final question is, what could you do differently? How could you behave differently at any of the stages in the drama triangle, any of those places. To rec recognize psychological games in coaching, you need to be, have that kind of 
second position where you're observing what's going on and you're listening to what's going on and there's a part of you that's kind of analyzing from a slightly objective perspective. But games happen a lot and because they end in negative feelings, they're likely to be the kind of things that you get brought to your coaching sessions. So you need to be thinking in terms of if we've got two or more people involved in this dynamic, you might have a game. If you get a sense that there's something not quite right about the situation, you might have a game. If it's repetitive, so the person brings you the same kind of problem time and time again. If it's predictable, so you have a sense, you know, I can understand what's going on here, but the other individual can't. If you have that switch point, which is I'm not really quite sure what's happening here. What happened there? How did that manage to change? And if somebody ends with a bad feeling, the likelihood is you've got a game that's going on. A really good question is to ask about that bad feeling. How familiar is that to you? Right. How often do you feel like that? What's the earliest you can remember feeling like that? Now, in order to avoid games, there's something called the healthy triangle, which is rather than being the persecutor, you recognize your own power and capacity to act. Rather than being rescuer, you respond rather than do more of the work. And rather than being a victim, you recognize your own vulnerabilities. But what you also do, as, as, as potent or powerful position, you recognize your own capacity to act, but also you, you recognize your own vulnerabilities. The fact that you also need support, you haven't got it all right. As a rescuer, you recognize, again, your own power to act, but the other person's power to act and you recognize your own vulnerability. And to be vulnerable, you recognize your insecurities and your fears, you ask for help, but you also get your own capacity to act, that you have it within your power to make changes. And that's how you step out of a game. Avoiding games in the first place, most of the games that I come across in coaching supervision are down to lack of contracting at the beginning. So not having clear, that clarity that Robert Holding was talking about this morning, not having that clarity around why you're coaching, what people want to achieve, what the organization wants to achieve through coaching, and also the clarity, I don't know if you're familiar with the three levels of contracting, that again is something you can research. The administrative level, so getting when you're going to meet where, how much it's going to cost, how often, etc. The professional level, are people ready for coaching? Are they prepared to make changes? Do they understand the coaching process? Are you competent as a coach to work with them? And that psychological level, do you think you're being invited in to coach to fulfill a hidden agenda? Contracting, getting that clarity at the beginning, helps to avoid game playing, because game players like lack of clarity. Do not become more invested in your coachee changing than they are. While ever them changing is more of a problem for you than it is for them, they are unlikely to change and you disempower them. Be prepared to walk away. Be prepared to challenge. You know, this is not a problem for me. This is a problem for you. So make sure they have to own the problem before they own the solution. So make sure they understand they have a problem and therefore they need to be looking for the solution, not you. <coughs> Don't do anything for your clients that they can do for themselves. So within organizations it's different because you're paid by the organization to coach. But if you're coaching people outside the organization and you're coaching for free, for example, and that means l not payment in kind, the likelihood is you are rescuing. Mutuality is a key to not rescuing and not being victim. So make sure if you're coaching that there's some kind of payment in kind or exchange. Have 
your own supervision and own therapy so you understand your own games. Because you may, if you don't understand your own games and don't have supervision, involve your clients in your games, as well as being invited by the client into theirs. And another a really good activity to do, which I sometimes do with coaching supervisees, if you've got a number of coaches, reflect on, are there certain things that you will accept from one coachee and not another? Are there certain things that you'll do for one coachee and not another? So for example, if you have one coachee where you'll overrun time, but you won't overrun time with your other coachees, why? Why are they so special? If you're allowing somebody to contact you out of hours when you don't allow it anybody else, how come? Because those again are indicators that you may be rescuing them or having different expectations. And finally, this is Stephen Cartman. Avoid slippery places, slippery people and slippery thinking. By slippery, if you can't pin somebody down, you're more likely to get sucked into a game. Clarity is the enemy of game playing. Right. Okay, so just invite you to um, reflect on what, so what now, what model, which is what have you learned today, so what are the implications, and now what are you going to do differently? And finally, just to leave you with, this was an advertisement that I found in an American magazine. I don't know if you can see the strap line at the bottom, but it basically says people are easier to manage when you know what they're really like. But what you have in the workplace, you have adults, but internally you may be getting that different ego state experience. And it's really important to bear that in mind when you're dealing with people. Are you dealing with their child, with their parent, or with them? All right. And that's the end of the workshop. I'll be sending out... I'll be sending out a handout um, which has notes on and the John James game plan as well and a copy of the slides if people are interested. Thank you very much for your attention.